Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. The term missing 411 was coined by David Pollitt, a former police officer turned investigator who noticed a really weird and disturbing trend in a lot of disappearances. People just vanish in places that make no sense for them to vanish and they cannot be found when they should realistically be easily found and you'll see what I mean more when I get into some examples. And if they are found, which again is already a really rare occurrence, they're found in places that make absolutely no sense for them to be found, such as areas that were already searched or places that are so far away or so hard to get to, like up mountains and stuff, that it's almost impossible for a human to get there without any kind of extra like technology or help. Now today I wanted to talk about two cases that I found particularly interesting with this missing 411 phenomenon. The first one is David Gonzalez, who was a nine-year-old who went missing in the San Bernardino National Forest, and the other one is Charles McCuller, who was a young photographer who went to take some pictures in Crater Lake National Park, and he also went missing. So let's talk about these cases, let's talk about some theories as to what could have happened, let's explain them, and this should be a pretty fun and scary time. So let's get straight into this. David Gonzalez was just nine years old, and he was full of that childhood energy that makes anything seem like an adventure. On July 31st, 2004, he and his family set out on what was supposed to be a relaxing camping trip in the San Bernardino National Forest, but obviously it didn't turn out that way. The area they chose wasn't like anything crazy. It was like a pretty normal, traditional, like common camping ground for families. Like it was really well known and well used. Like it was used all the time. The forest was actually really pretty. It had a bunch of pine trees everywhere. I mean, it was the kind of place that you would want to go camping to just escape from, you know, modern life or whatever. So David's family was setting up camp. They were getting everything ready, putting up their tents, organizing their food and everything. And David, you know, being a little kid, he got hungry, so he asked his mom if he could go get some cookies from the car, which was parked about 50 yards or 150 feet away from where they were setting up. So it wasn't that far away. It was like maybe a minute or two walk, right? He went to get cookies, and that was the last time he was ever seen or heard from again. Now, obviously, at first, there was no panic. Nobody knew what happened, you know? It was just calm. And then after a few minutes, his mom got worried and called his name out heard nothing, went to the car, and discovered nothing. No evidence, no David, no anything. It was just as if he had disappeared in thin air. Like, there was no footprints, there was no sign of where he had gone, no sound or anything. And you know, it's like only, it's like really close. You would have heard like any kind of screaming, any kind of yelling, anything like that. But no evidence of where he had gone. I mean, what gets me about this personally is how there's no like, you would hear a kid screaming if he was being taken or like, rustling of trees or someone running away like you'll be able to hear that right in an empty forest where there's no sound pollution there's no anything like it'd be quiet as hell i mean it's a forest that's like meant to be empty and you don't hear even like trees rustling from somebody like running away through the trees like nothing it's just crazy Within hours, the family contacted the authorities, and the authorities came and conducted a full-scale rescue operation search party to find David Gonzalez. They had everything too. They had rescue teams, helicopters, tracking dogs, and volunteers. Like, it was a huge scale thing. Despite hundreds of people, dogs, everything, there was no sign of him. I mean, like, I can kind of get it if, like, the family can't see anything, you know, because families, like, they're not professionals. They're not trained to like find people, you know? But an entire, like the police, a search party, everything, people that were trained to do this came, they found no footprints, no pieces of clothing, no clues at all. It was like he just disappeared, like fell into the back rooms or something. Like these people who are trained to look for the exact signs of what would happen found nothing. And that's what I'm saying, because people like, I mean, my first thought is like, maybe he just like walked away, right? But these people are trained to find it. Okay, it's just, it's crazy. Obviously there were signs of him like walking to the car, but like other than that, there were no signs of him walking anywhere else other than just like the 50 yards to the car. Now, while the search might have ended, the theories of what happened to David are far from over. Was it an abduction? Was it a ghost? Was he, was he just like really sneaky? Let's find out. So the first theory that people go to is abduction by a stranger. This one is like the most straightforward, obvious answer. He was just taken by somebody. It's a theory that's hard to ignore. And after all, it's a terrifying possibility that crosses every parent's mind when their child just disappears. But this theory doesn't really make a lot of sense for some reasons. On one hand, Dave's disappearance was so sudden and complete that it would make sense that they had like, he had like somebody to do it for him. Cause like, it seems so like well thought out, like for him to leave no evidence or anything, it seems really like 
evident that there would be somebody who knew what they were doing, who would know not to leave like any marks or like any evidence. But there's a problem with this theory. Despite the road being nearby, like the road where the car was parked, it it wasn't exactly a high traffic area. Like it was an abandoned road out in the middle of nowhere. Like how would an abductor know that David would be alone or he would even be there in the first place at all? And how could they have snatched him without leaving any kind of a sign of struggle or evidence or anything? I mean, there were no witnesses, no tire tracks, no signs that a vehicle had been there at all. In most abduction cases, even in remote areas, something is left behind, like footprints, disturbed ground, or a witness who saw something out of place. I mean, that's how the police works. Like the police have, you know, taken like hundreds of years to figure out the best ways to do that. And there's nothing. The second theory that people go to is an animal attack. The San Bernardino National Forest is home to a lot of different animals that could have done an attack, like mountain lions and bears, again, both of which are capable of attacking a child. But once again, the details don't quite add up. Let's consider a mountain lion, for example. These animals are known for their stealth and their speed, and there have been documented cases of mountain lions attacking humans, particularly children. But all animal attacks leave some kind of evidence, blood, clothing, tracks, something that would indicate that some kind of a violent encounter took place. I mean, that kind of thing doesn't just happen without leaving any evidence. And while a mountain lion could potentially have dragged a small child away, I mean, there'd be no, like, again, like the footprints, anything. Like, the search party would have found that. And plus, they would have heard that. They would have heard a mountain lion attack, right? Especially with the, with the dogs. They could, like, smell stuff. You know, like, they're, like, trained to smell animals. And the same thing with the bears, obviously. Now, the third theory is the supernatural. This one is the most intriguing and the most likely, honestly, given the weird circumstances of this case. One of the more outlandish theories suggests that David might have actually been sunken into a different dimension, like the back rooms or something. Like, not actually like the back rooms, but he might have been sunken into some kind of other dimension. I mean, is it possible that there's something supernatural happened? Is it possible that he fell into the back rooms? I mean, we can disprove it, so I guess maybe? And now the fourth theory is another one that's kind of supernatural, but a little bit different. It's the theory that there was an unseen predator or a supernatural abductor of some kind. Some suggest that David might have fallen prey to a predator that isn't exactly all physical, you know, like a cryptid or something. Could be an undiscovered species or a ghost or something else entirely. I mean, it leaves room in your mind to think about, which is really why these cases are so interesting is that there's no explanation so your mind doesn't stop thinking of like how it could have happened. Like there's there's so many possibilities because there's exactly like no evidence at all. Finally, we have the actual most probable theory as to what happened to David. Human error in the environment. This one's boring. This one's so boring to talk about, but I have to mention it because it's the one that's probably true. It's just not as fun. This is a theory that David's disappearance was just a tragic accident, the result of human error and the harsh environment. Like maybe the search party was just really dumb that day and they didn't know what they were doing. You know, maybe David being a nine-year-old who's dumb, got disoriented or lost and just walked the wrong way, got lost, something happened to him and the search party was just too incompetent to find it. This one is still kind of iffy though, because I mean, you'd think a search party of hundreds of people and trained like detectives and stuff would be able to find at least some kind of footprint or trace or smell like the dogs would smell something, right? Or like his remains were never found either. Like they never found his body, his clothes, anything that was never found. Now, honestly, the disappearance of David Gonzalez leaves us with more questions than answers. Like every theory as to what could have happened doesn't make sense. Like none of the theories make sense. We might never know what happened to him. I don't think we will. I mean, I'm, I'll get into my personal theory theory as to what's happening with the missing 411. Oh my god, my chains aren't on. My chains aren't showing. You guys gotta see my drip. I'll get into my personal theories about what happened later on in the video. Um, so yeah, let's get into the next case then. The beauty of Crater Lake National Park in Oregon is undeniable. The lake, which was formed by a collapsed volcano, is the deepest lake in the United States, with water so clear and blue that it seems almost otherworldly. The surrounding wilderness is vast and rugged and really hard to like walk across, making it a perfect destination for those seeking some kind of challenge with hiking and stuff. But for 19-year-old Charles McCuller, this adventure into the beauty and an attempt to take photographs of it, you know, document it because it's so beautiful, turned into more of a awful, sad, unfortunate mystery. Charles McCuller wasn't an average tourist. That's the one thing I want to get out of the way 
immediately. He was not just some guy with a camera who didn't know what he was doing. He was a seasoned outdoorsman. He knew how to navigate the wild. He had done this many times before in even more rugged and dangerous terrain. In January of 1975, he set out on a cross-country trip that would take him from his home in Virginia to various national parks across the country. He did this because he has a passion for photography and he wanted to take pictures of the beautiful landmarks along the way. And he was determined to capture the untouched beauty of Crater Lake in the winter, a time when few dared to go there because it was covered in so much snow, making it even more dangerous. This trip was awesome for him until it wasn't because he never ever returned from that trip. On January 29th, 1975, Charles McCuller arrived in Crater Lake National Park. He left his van with a friend planning to hike into the park, take some photos and return in a day or two. So that already kind of shows you that it's like a really dangerous place. Like it's a day or two hike he was gonna take. He left his friend there and said, I'll be back in like two days. Like that's not just like a regular hike, you know? The snow was so deep too. This says it was over five feet there at Crater Lake National Park, over five feet of snow. And he was gonna go there just like for fun to take pictures. Like that's crazy. Like that just shows how committed this guy and how confident he was in the fact that he thought he could like do this you know like he was a seasoned outdoorsman five feet of snow in like an awful terrain and he thought he could do it he was confident and he had the right gear too like he prepared he wasn't just like coming unprepared he had the exact right gear but the weather in the mountains can be very unpredictable and what might seem like a manageable hike could turn deadly if something goes wrong days passed and there was no word from charles his friend who had agreed to meet with him after the hike got really concerned and reported him missing and then they called the police. The search that followed was absolutely insane. Park rangers, search and rescue teams, even the FBI came involved. The FBI was here for this. Helicopters flew over the area, like actual helicopters were there trying to find any sign of him, which just goes to show too, that if they need helicopters, like how dangerous is this place? Like I know they had search and rescue teams, but if they had to have helicopters too, like they must have like had places that they couldn't go themselves, which you'll see why is even scarier. For months, the search continued. Multiple months, the search was going on. But despite the best efforts of everybody involved, including the freaking FBI, there was no trace of Charles. No footprints, no gear, no sign of where he had gone. It was like the snow just like swallowed him whole or something. But this one's crazier, okay? This one I think is crazier than the David case because get this. In October 1976, almost two years after Charles McCuller went missing, guess what happened? Another hiker stumbled upon something really strange deep into the wilderness of Crater Lake. It was a small campsite, but there was no tent, no sleeping bag, just a few scattered items and a pair of jeans. The jeans were placed neatly on the ground, like not scattered, like neatly placed on the ground, with the belt still threaded through the loops. Inside the jeans were two human leg bones. And they were perfectly preserved by the cold. Like imagine how terrifying that would be to find. Anyways, here's where it gets strange. Above the knees, there was nothing. This was Charles McCullers legs, nothing else. It was like somebody cut him in half and just left the legs there inside the jeans. Nearby searchers found his camera still intact and a few personal items, but no other evidence of what happened to him. No sign of a struggle, no evidence of what it might have like caused his death. And here's where it gets even creepier. The area where the remains were found was so remote and so difficult to access that like the FBI and the teams and stuff had no idea how Charles could have even gotten there. Like it seemed impossible. It was miles from where he was expected to hike, right? So it wasn't like where he was going to hike. It was miles and miles away from his like projected plan of where he was going to hike. And when he was found, it wasn't snowing. It was just like the regular park, right? but it was snowing again five feet deep whenever he went missing. So he traveled miles in a place he wasn't even like trying to go to in five feet deep snow. Like how the hell does that happen? Like all the experts agreed that the deep snow should have made it nearly impossible for him to reach that location. So what, what the hell happened to Charles McCuller? How did a seasoned outdoorsman like him end up in this insane place with only the lower half of his body like remaining? Let's get into those theories. Now, one of the most commonly suggested explanations is that Charles fell to hypothermia, which I'm sure you know what it is, but basically technically it's just when your body loses heat faster than your body can produce heat. That's what hypothermia is. In extreme cold, hypothermia can set in pretty quickly, even for someone as prepared as Charles. Like hypothermia is known to take people like that. But there are a few reasons why this doesn't work. Number one, his legs were still in his jeans. Why does that matter? So hypothermia can lead to something called paradoxical undressing. This phenomenon causes people to become 
disoriented and I guess really stupid because they start feeling like they're really hot when they're succumbing to hypothermia and they start removing all of their clothes because they feel like they're overheating. But his legs were still in there. He didn't take off his clothes. And also this doesn't explain why half his body is just missing and how the hell he got like miles and miles from where he was supposed to be. Like that is still, is this, this one doesn't add up. This theory does not add up. So let's go to theory two. Another theory that often comes up in cases like this is animal predation. This one makes a little bit more sense. The wilderness around Crater Lake is also a home to creatures like bears and mountain lions, which both of which we already said, could potentially ravage a human body. It's possible that Charles could have died from hypothermia or something else, and then animals came, scavenged his body, and dragged half of it away to a different location. But this theory also has its flaws. For one, the area where he was found showed no signs of any kind of struggle or anything like that, no signs of an animal doing anything to his body. Typically, if a bear or mountain lion had been involved, there would be clear evidence like tracks, disturbed ground, or more scattered remains. And then there's the fact that his genes were found still intact, which makes no sense especially considering that the belt was still threaded through the loops, like his belt was still on. It's hard to imagine an animal carefully, like, removing his pants and leaving them behind so neatly. So this one's a possibility and it makes more sense than just hypothermia. It doesn't quite fit with everything here, so let's go to the next theory. Some have suggested that Charles may have suffered a fatal accident in the wilderness, and this is what caused his remains to be found so weirdly. Crater Lake's terrain is very treacherous, especially in the winter. Again, it has a lot of hidden crevices and steep cliffs and stuff, and it's possible that Charles fell or became trapped, and he was unable to call or make his way back to safety. But this theory, like the others, leaves a lot of open questions. Like, if Charles had fallen or become trapped, why wasn't his body found in one piece? Like, he was split in half. Like, that's insane. And then how did he manage to even reach that location in the first place? given the harsh conditions. And why did the search teams, who scavenged the place again for months, the FBI was in on this, not find anything? Now, given the strange circumstances, a lot of people have theorized that some sort of foul play was involved in Charles' disappearance. It's possible that he encountered someone, or something, during his hike that led to all of this crazy weird shit happening. The remote location of his remains could be explained by someone trying to cover up what they did by making it seem unexplainable, and then placing the body in an area that they thought would never be found. But as with all the other theories, this one raises so many more questions than answers. For one, if foul play was involved, why were his belongings left behind? Why was his camera? a valuable, like, he was like a good photographer, this is like an expensive camera. Why was that just like left behind, like a super valuable piece of equipment? And why the hell, again, is he cut in half? Why is only his lower half remaining? The fifth theory, again, is the supernatural one. As with many cases in the missing 411 phenomenon, the lack of evidence has led a lot of people to consider less than scientific explanations. Could Charles have encountered something in the wilderness that defies our understanding of reality, like an entity a force or a presence that caused his disappearance to be so weird and his remains to be in such an unexplainable state. As with many cases in the missing 411 phenomenon, this seems outlandish, but again, it makes the most sense out of pretty much anything because there's, I mean, nothing here makes sense, dude. Nothing here makes sense. But like I promised earlier, here's my theory as to what's happening in these places, okay? You're gonna call me crazy, but I don't see any explanation making any more sense than government experimentation or interference, okay? Number one, missing 411 always takes place in national parks owned by the government. Also, if the government is involved in the search efforts, they can cover up evidence, obviously. Like, it's like the FBI was involved in Charles McCullers one, right? So the FBI, if they're behind it, or the CIA, whatever, they could link with each other and like cover up the evidence of like hiding what actually happened. I don't know what they're using it for, but I don't see anything else that makes any more sense. Like given that all the information that we have in these cases is from the government, like pretty much because even from newspapers and stuff, it's given to them by the government, like the cops, like telling them information, right? Like leaking it. So if it's all coming from the government, Maybe the government is hiding certain details to make it seem unexplainable so that they don't get caught for what they're doing. But that's an outlandish theory. I'm not saying it's actually true exactly. That's just, it just makes the most sense to me. Let me know in the comments if you want to see more videos on this kind of thing. This was fun to make. Let me know what you think about the camera. I mean, this is new for me, for my channel. I think it was pretty fun though. I enjoyed making this video for you guys. Missing 411 is so cool to me. Leave a comment, subscribe, leave a like, and have a great night. Sweet dreams.